In this episode, I'm going to be telling you guys 12 things, 12 things that people do not consider or do not put into consideration while moving abroad. It is my desire that when you learn about these 12 things that people never think about or never plan for before they move to a different country, whether people moving to the UK, moving to Canada, moving to Australia, moving to the United States, at the end of this video, you'll be properly equipped to make proper preparation as to how you can move to a different country, whether you're moving to work, whether you're moving to study, or you're just moving to visit, okay? So if you're interested in finding out the 12 points or the 12 things that people never ever consider while moving abroad, why don't you give me one second? I'm gonna dash up to the market and you guys already know I'm gonna be right back with more. You know the way I do it when I drop lyrical. Anytime I spit lyrical, philosophical, all the niggas mimical, but they stare still on taking literal. Punch nine score lateral. Snag them up that Hello, Chronics. Hello, YouTube. How are you, 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 you all doing today? It's still your value based king, Fuse from FuseChronicles.com. We are your number one stop for everything and anything related to travel, tourism, and lifestyle. Now, like I said in the introduction, in this episode, I'm going to be telling you guys 12 things that most people who are moving abroad, whether moving to study, moving to work, or just moving as tourists to different countries, particularly Taiwan countries. Now, Taiwan countries are countries like the United Kingdom, the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Finland, these are all Taiwan countries. Now, most people, it is my experience that most people, this is what I've observed with most people, not everybody, just most people, they travel to these countries and then upon touching down in those cities, in these countries I mentioned before, they start to make preparations and arrangements for things that they should have prepared for before they travel. Okay, in this video, I'm going to try to bomb them as quickly as possible so you guys will get these points quickly and I don't need to make this a very extended video. So please guys, watch this video to the very end. I get very surprised when I see people that just watch a fraction of this video and then they hit us on Instagram, on TikTok and on Twitter with all these inquiries and I start to wonder, why didn't you guys just watch the entire video? You don't even have to read this stuff. All you need to do is just sit down, get a pen, get a pad, and take notes, and you'll be good. But we get these inquiries every day, and I wonder just why they don't watch this information. Half information is worse than no information. So it's my desire that you guys watch this video to the very end. Now, the number one mistake that people make is thinking that your proof of funds is going to cover everything that they need for their journey and staying in their select city or select country for the first couple of months. Now your proof of funds or the money that you set aside in a different account is just supposed to look after your upkeep or your family's upkeep for the first couple of months, meaning one, two or three months. That money does not solve your flight tickets, okay? So if you're traveling, say you're traveling to the UK or you're traveling to Canada or the US or Australia, these are four favorite or popular destinations that most people relocate to. Say you're relocating to any one of these destinations, you still need to board a plane. So you need to buy a flight ticket to be able to move to this country. Now, you might be from a country where there is no direct flight, neither is there any connecting flight to these countries I listed. So you might need to move by road from your country to another country. Say, for example, you are from Cape Verde 
or you are from the Republic of Benin, I don't think, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think there's a direct flight or any flight at all from these countries to the UK or to Canada or to the United States. You might need to go to the nearest country like Nigeria or Ghana to be able to get a flight directly to the UK or at least a connecting flight to Frankfurt and then to the UK. So you need to bear this in mind and if you're going to have to do this, the money you're going to have to spend is not going to be covered by your proof of funds. You need to have extra cash to cover these expenses. Another thing that you probably don't even take into consideration is if you're relocating to either Canada, the United States, Australia, or the United Kingdom with your whole family. Now your family means you as the primary applicant, your partner, and your children. And maybe you're boarding a connecting flight that is going to take you first of all to Frankfurt and then you're going to connect another flight to the UK. You might lay over for a period that's going to extend to maybe even five to seven hours. In some cases, even ten hours. Your children have to feed. They need to eat food. Do you have enough money to be able to provide sustenance for your children? I mean a meal. It could be that maybe the airline company you're traveling with is not taking responsibility for the food your children are going to eat and you might need to go out to a restaurant in the airport and buy something for your kids. Do you have the amount of money? Do you have the resources to be able to provide for your family? These are things that you need to take into consideration if you are flying with your family. Now, this is just number one. Number two, if you are traveling to Canada, to the US, to the UK, or Australia for work, are you seeking the services of a recruitment agency to help you find jobs, to help you relocate to this country? Say, for example, you're using Randstad. Now, Randstad is a recruitment agency out in the Netherlands, and they also have an office in the UK. So they help people who are interested in going to Europe to find work. Now, there are many people that reach out to me. I know there's a guy reached out to me here on YouTube, and he was telling me, Fuse, have you heard about this company? They are a recruitment company, and they offer me all their services to get me to Europe. Now, the most a recruitment agency can do for you is just to help you find work. You have to apply to that company. The recruitment agency is not going to help you apply for a job in the company that is sending listings out for you for. You have to apply, fill in the application form, upload your CV, put in your cover letter, and send it out to these companies yourself. Yes, there are recruitment companies like Indeed where you can apply, you can upload your CV and cover letter on their website and when there's an opening, all you need to do is just to click send and they send your CV and cover letter from Indeed to this company. They do it on your behalf. However, no recruitment company is going to pay your travel fare for you to come to Europe. If you get a recruitment company that tells you, Fuse, Sheila, Jessica, Aquaba, whatever your name is, we want you. We're going to transport you to come to Europe, to come to America, to come to the Oceania countries or to Asia to work. That is human trafficking, okay? No recruitment agency, I don't care how big they are, is going to pay your relocation expenses for you to come to the UK. Most recruitment companies, like every other company worldwide, are trying to cut costs and maximize the bottom line, meaning they're trying to cut costs and maximize on your profit. So if they tell you they're going to transport you, it's just human trafficking. I can assure you, I can assure you that when you get to these countries, you're not going to be doing the jobs that you signed up for. Say, for example, you signed up for maybe a customer representative job, you're going to be doing something closely related to prostitution or some dodgy kind of work. You need to be mindful. I know there are many people who are very desperate to get to Europe, to get to America, or to get to other continents. If a company who claims to be a recruitment company or agency is telling you, I repeat, telling you that they're going to pay your airfare and everything, accommodation bills and all, and all this kind of stuff, 
for you to get to a foreign country, maybe Italy, maybe Spain, maybe the Netherlands, maybe Germany, that is human trafficking. So let your antennas be up, and when you get this kind of message, be sure to run away because you're definitely going to be doing something very dodgy. Number three, what type of city do you want to live in? Say you want to go to the UK, are you always thinking about London? Oh God, views London. Are you always thinking about Manchester? Are you always thinking about Liverpool? Or maybe you're thinking about America. Are you always thinking about LA? Are you always thinking about New York? Or maybe you're thinking about France. Are you always thinking about Paris? Are you always thinking about places like Amsterdam? Are you always thinking about Beijing when you think about China? You need to understand one thing, guys. The more the cosmopolitan nature of the city, the more expensive the cost of living is going to be. And yes, granted, if you get jobs in these cities, you're going to be paid high wages. But the high wages you get paid, the system is going to suck that money back in by way of expensive or exorbitant cost of living. Accommodation expensive, feeding expensive, transportation expensive. It's not worth it. So if you get paid, say for example, you're working in London, you could get paid monthly 3,000 pounds or four to 5,000 pounds. The accommodation is expensive. Eating out in a restaurant is expensive, buying clothes is expensive, all this other stuff that accumulates to your cost of living are very expensive. I would rather you guys live in a place like Nottingham or in a place like Derby or Leicester and work in London. That way you get paid high wages but you are not paying or giving the money back to the system by way of cost of living. And it's the same for Canada, people living in Toronto or people who want to go to Vancouver or these kind of places. You can live in the suburbs and still work in a cosmopolitan city whereby they pay you money but you don't have to spend all that money in maintaining a certain lifestyle. Most people never, never give this extra thought. People are more carried away with the exotic names of these cities. Oh, Fuse, where are you right now? Oh, man, look, check me out. Big boy, I'm in New York. That is just name. If I work in New York and live in New York, I'm making huge amounts of money, but I'm still giving it back to the system. Most people that I know who are trying to be wise work in New York, but they live in the suburbs. They might live in places like New Jersey or those other places that are far away from downtown New York. So they work, get this huge amount of money, but they don't have to spend too much by way of high cost of living. So this is something that you need to consider and a mistake you need to avoid. Number four. What are your housing plans? So you're moving abroad. When you touch down in London, okay, because people who are traveling to the UK, you either touch down in Gatwick or you touch down in Heathrow. So you touch down in London. What are your plans? And it's even worse for people who are moving with their families. Do you have a relative or a friend in the foreign country that is going to accept you, that is going to receive you, who, in whose place you're going to stay in for maybe a week to a month till you find your foot in, then you move to your own house? Or are you just like everybody else, a novice, you get to this city, you don't have anybody, no friend, nobody, you're just a JJC, what people call a journey just comes, someone who is just new in a city and does not even know anything about the place and just realize, oh my God, I never even thought about where we're going to stay or where we're going to spend the night. If you are moving to London, to Canada, to the United States, to Australia, there are two things you can do, or maybe three, but I'll just put it down to two things. You can either make plans to stay in a bread and breakfast. A bread and breakfast is like your motel accommodation, very cheap and affordable. You could even stay there for a week or two weeks so you find a place where you're going to make a down payment for your monthly rent and move in with your family. Or you could stay in an Airbnb. And Airbnb is a, a kind of accommodation that most people who are traveling abroad for the first time, most people who don't have concrete plans of where to stay, they usually put up in an Airbnb. 
this, this is just a network of low-cost housing. Of course, the Airbnb accommodations are very expensive, but in Airbnb, you have you're spoiled for choice. You can choose one that's very cheap, very affordable. You can choose the ones that just fit your spending bracket. You use an Airbnb, like I said, or you can use a bread and breakfast. But you need to make plans of where you're going to stay as soon as you get off the plane. Don't be those people that just hang around train stations wondering, asking questions. Sir, where's the cheapest place you stay? Sir, or asking a taxi driver, where's the cheapest hotel? Listen guys, if you're in a taxi in a foreign country, and the foreign country, the, the taxi, I beg your pardon, is just driving around town looking for the cheapest accommodation, best believe that the meter in the taxi is reading. The meter is reading. So when they eventually take you to a place where you're going to be staying, where they call a cheap accommodation, you could end up paying as much as 100 to 150 pounds in a taxi fare for something that you would have just paid maybe even five pounds in the first place. I've been in a cab before where the taxi took the, the long route just because he wanted the meter to just charge me the most. Do not fall into this kind of mistake. Do not fall into this error. Plan where you're going to stay even before you take off from your home country. It's going to save you a lot of headaches at the end of the day. And the next point is, what plans do you have for your children? So you're moving abroad with your whole family. I'm happy for you. You got your work visa. The company sent you a certificate of sponsorship for the UK or a sponsorship letter for the Netherlands. Whatever country you're going to outside the country, it might be in America, it might be in Europe, they sent you that document that you're going to move with your family with. Now, what are your plans for your family? When I mean your family, I don't mean your husband or your wife. Those are adults that can take care of themselves. I'm talking about your kids. Do you know that most countries in Europe, in America, and in Australia do not let children into schools until they are five years to seven years old? Do you know this? It means your kids are going to have to stay home. They cannot start school till they turn five, and in some countries, even six or even seven. What are you going to do if your kids are not going to work? In England, for a fact, in England, even if your kids are 16 to 17 years old, you cannot leave them unsupervised at home. Even if you're leaving them for just five minutes, you are going against the terms and condition of your visa. So what are you going to do? Now there's some choices or there's some options that you could explore. You could get a child minder who is like a nanny who looks after your child if you're comfortable with leaving your child to strangers, which I'm not personally. Or you could take your child and put them in a child support kind of home, kind of care home for children where they could get informal education, watching cartoons, reading books, singing lullabies and stuff like this. Or you could request your family member or relative to travel to the UK, to Canada, to the US, to Australia. You could send them an invitation letter and they will come in and then they can leave in and look after your kids on your behalf. The first and the second option, which is a child minder and a minder support home, they are very expensive. There are many, many people who have traveled abroad who are complaining of spending outrageous amounts of money to child minders to look after their kids or even support homes to look after their kids. It's too expensive. And even bringing your relative to the UK, to Canada, to the US, or to Australia is also expensive because you have to pay flight fares, you have to pay all the costs of relocating this person from where she is in your home country to where you are right now in a foreign country. If you want my candid opinion, if you want my candid opinion, I'll tell you guys the best thing that you can do is to weigh it. You and your partner can both weigh it. Which of you, I'm talking about the primary applicant for the work visa and the partner, or the primary applicant for the student visa and the partner, which of you is earning more than the other person? The person that earns the most 
can continue working and the person that earns less can resign from his or her job and stay home and look after the kids okay can stay home and look after the kids or alternatively you could get a stay-at-home job whereby you don't need to leave the house you can stay in your house and work while looking after your kids at the same time so these are options that you could explore but please if you have children and you want to relocate with your children abroad please do not overlook this one point it's very very serious there are many families that i know that violated the terms of their visa terms and conditions by overlooking this one step and i know families that say okay fuse that's it that's it i'm going to leave my child or my children back home in my home country and i'm going to travel abroad when they turn five when they turn six i'm going to bring them over to this country and they can start school you can do that that's a, that's a, that's an option that is an option you could explore but be mindful of this one thing if your child is 16 or 17 and is about to turn 18 now children who are between 18 to 25 maybe they're not children anymore maybe they're not children anymore i'm talking about late teens to early adults who are 18 to 25 it's very difficult in most of the taiwan countries it's very difficult to relocate these children to countries where you are in now if your child is one of those wild ones those wild cards who have already started getting cozy and friendly with the ladies and maybe get a girl pregnant believe me when i tell you this it's even doubly or triply difficult to relocate your child from your home country to where you are in a foreign country if he or she already has dependents so you need to bear this in mind you need to think about this deeply if you want to leave your children back home and relocate alone number six what is the nature of work what is your job specification when you relocate to countries like the uk to canada to the us to australia to the netherlands what are you going to be doing i see a lot of people sending me messages telling me fuse i want to get a job as a health care assistant i want to get a job as a leave-in caregiver let me tell you something guys if you are a leave-in caregiver or a health care assistant you're going to be working 12 hour days it means you're going to resume work by 8 in the morning and you're going to be closing from work by 8 p.m at night and this is if you're not doing any ot OT is overtime. Some people might have to do overtime whereby they work from 8 to 8 and have to do overtime to 8 the next month. That is mad. That is wicked. Okay? Now, you're going to be doing this five days a week. For living caregivers, usually the arrangement is you're going to be working two weeks on and two weeks off. So it means five days a week for two weeks. Now, if you're a leaving caregiver and you're working for a client who is nasty, you know them ones who are maybe not even mentally stable, who throw things at you, curse at you, or racial towards you, or are racist towards you, this could break your spirit. Now, I know it doesn't, doesn't mean a lot, okay? Because some of you might be thinking, oh, Fuse, the money is good. You're paying me 4,000 pounds a week. You're paying me ten thousand pounds a week. By the way, no company is going to pay you ten thousand pounds a week, or even four thousand pounds a week. Okay. In fact, no company is going to pay you ten thousand pounds a month. Okay. The most you can get is between three, or in fact, one thousand five hundred to five thousand pounds a month. And five thousand pounds a month is a stretch. Okay. But in before you get to that money. The job could break your spirit. I've heard tales of women and even some men that even lost their mind because of the nature of work that they had to do as a healthcare assistant or a leave-in caregiver. So you guys need to weigh this deeply, okay? Think about this well so you're not going to make the mistake of making all this money and then using that money to look after yourself because you are now psychologically no more there. Okay, now number seven. Do you plan to work multiple jobs? Do you plan to work 
two jobs or three jobs in the UK, in Canada, in the US, in Australia? Do you plan to? I'm not even going to discourage you. I'm not here to discourage you from working multiple jobs. Sometimes that's the only way you can make ends meet. So I'm not even going to knock that hustle. However, if you are working the first job, be sure to get the internal revenue services for the country you are working in as a foreign national. Be sure to get them to assign you the right tax code, okay? That's going to be the deductions you're going to have to pay to the government of that country by virtue of taxation. If you're getting a second job, even doubly still, be sure to ring up the Internal Revenue Service and tell them, listen, I'm working this job and I'm working that job. Can you please cross-check that I've been assigned a tax code? What usually happens is people, particularly those in the United Kingdom, you get assigned to the right tax code for the first job, but for the second job, you don't even get assigned a tax code at all. So they're going to be charging you at a very high or elevated tax bracket. That is not good because you're going to be losing a lot by way of earnings. You're going to be losing a lot of money. So some people think, oh, I'm not going to tell them that I have a second job. Oh, I'm just going to be making this money in the dark and nobody's going to tax me. No, the tax man knows everything. Unless you go, you're working for a restaurant or some form of organization where they pay you with cash. They don't pay you via your bank account. If the money touches your bank account, best believe the tax man is going to get his. So, like I said, unless you're being paid cash where you work, then you can boycott the system. I'm not telling you guys to go to evade your taxes. I'm just telling this is how it works. Be sure to make sure or make sure that you get assigned a tax code for your first and second job so you don't get taxed at an elevated tax bracket. Yes, if you find out that you're being overly taxed and maybe they've run through your system, they've checked your statement and you realize that no, you've not been assigned to a tax code, you could claim back a refund on money that has been deducted from your salary for the previous months that this has been happening, but that's a very uphill tax. From the very beginning, from the jump, just make sure that you're properly assigned or you're just gonna be working for the government and maybe the company you work for is not even a government-owned company. Okay, so you need to be mindful of this. Now, where are we? Where are we? Number eight, number nine, I'm not sure. But the next one, what visa subclass or category are you moving abroad with? And if you know the visa that you're moving abroad with, does it offer you a direct pathway to permanent residency in that country if this is what you are interested in moving abroad for in the first place? Very important, guys. I see people who reach out to me and tell me, Fuse, I want to move to New Zealand. I want to move to New Zealand. I want to move there first as a student, and then I'll see where my chips fall. Mistake wrong, okay? Now, I'm not telling you don't go to New Zealand to study, but people that go to New Zealand with a study visa or a student visa do not have a straight path to permanent residency. To become someone who can get permanent residency on a student visa, you have to switch from your student visa to maybe a temporary work visa or an essential worker visa or a critical worker visa. Now, these are visa categories or subcategories that put you on a straight path to permanent residency. For the UK, if you are in the UK with a visa that can only guarantee you can stay and work in the country for three to four years, that visa category cannot afford you a permanent residency. To become a permanent resident in the UK, you need to have stayed in that country working for at least five years. Okay, so your skilled worker visa, your health and care worker visa, your global talent visa, these are the visa categories that can assure you or guarantee you permanent residency for countries like the UK. So you need to be mindful of the visa subclass or category that you're moving to a foreign country on so that permanent residency does not pass you by. Nothing breaks my heart more 
that same people that tell confused, I've been here for 10 years and I ask you, sir, are you a permanent resident? He says, no. I'm like, oh God, what did you do? So you need to be mindful of this. Now the next point is, what is your permanent or what is your passport renewal policy for the country that you are moving to? So you're moving to the UK, you're moving to Canada, you're moving to Australia, you're moving to all these countries, but what is the passport policy? What can you do if your passport is about to expire or it has expired? For countries like Canada, if your passport expires and you get a new passport booklet, you will have to apply for a change in transfer, or you have to apply for a transfer of passports or a transfer of visa. What this means is they're going to get your, your previous passport checked to confirm it's expired, and then they're going to be stamp the visa that is in your previous passport in the new booklet. But you need to know what the renewal policy for your country while you are in this new country really is. Say for example, you're Nigerian like me, and you're moving to the UK. What is the passport renewal policy for Nigerians in the UK? Do you need to come back home to renew your passport? Do you need to just go to your high commission in the UK to renew your passport? How much does it cost? Do you need to send it to your home country to get renewed? Maybe someone's going to help you out. Or maybe there's an officer, an immigration officer stationed in your home country whose task is to renew your passport. What is the policy? You need to find out because usually, usually the way it works is you cannot stay in a foreign country with an expired passport booklet past a certain period. Usually it's between a month to three months. If the system finds out that your passport has been or has expired, that is grounds there for you to lose your status of that visa in that country. So you need to find this out and keep this information somewhere so when the time reaches, you can renew your passport and apply for your visa to be transferred to the new booklet on time. This is one point that most people usually never consider before they start their work visa application process. And the next one is, how are people of your race treated in that country, in that city where you're going to be relocating to? People who are black, people who are Chinese, people who are Hispanics, how are they treated in this country? Does this country has a track record of institutional racism, whereby people cannot go to certain places without being racially profiled, racially abused, or racially violated? You need to find this out. How can you find this out? Simply go on Google, type Azerbaijan racism, type Canada racism, type UK racism and read what people have to say about this. The only best way to know about racism is by what other people have suffered from the hands of racists. Don't jump in blind. Don't tell yourself, oh my God, I'm going to be earning pounds. I'm going to be earning in euros. I'm going to be earning in dollars. And then you jump into the deep end. Dude, there's some... I've been racially abused before. I feel who's... I have been racially abused before. Someone set his dog on me. I was on the floor screaming, help, help, mommy, mommy. <laughs> it's funny now, but it happened to me. It happened to me. I've been racially abused by someone in the UK. It's not an experience that you're going to forget in a hurry. So find out what the racial temperature is in that city that you're moving to. And ask yourself, honestly ask yourself, can I take this? Or should I just boycott the city and find work in a different country or in a different city? And in the same vein, find out the benefits. What are the benefits of people like me in this country, in this city? Do black people enjoy certain benefits? Do Chinese people, do Hispanics, do they enjoy certain benefits in this country or in this city? Find all this out before you jump on a plane and start relocating to a different country or a different city. And the next one is, how difficult is it to relocate from a foreign country to another foreign country? Maybe your plan all along is to relocate to the United States. Maybe all you 
want to do is move from Nigeria, from Ghana, from Syria alone, from the Sudan, from Chad. You want to move to the United States, but it's taking so long. And maybe somehow the UK, the doors to the UK opened up and you're going to the UK. Find out how hard is it for someone from Chad, someone from Nigeria, someone from Ghana to relocate from the UK to Canada, to the US. I can tell you guys for a fact that people from Somalia are not accepted in Canada. If you're traveling to, so to Canada, why am I stuttering? Why? If you're traveling to Canada from Somalia, your passport is not accepted. If you're traveling to Canada from South Africa with a temporary passport, it's not accepted. If you're traveling to Canada from the Czech Republic, it's not accepted. I can tell you for a fact that these countries do not accept people. Now, if you're Israeli, if you're from Israel and you're traveling to France, you are not welcome there. They don't accept Israeli passports. The UK does not accept Israeli passports. And the United States does not accept Israeli passports. So even though you're, you're moving from Israel to maybe the Philippines and then you want to try to apply to the UK, to the US, or to France in this country, it's not going to work. Unless you stayed in those countries for a period of time where you are now a permanent resident and you are given a passport for people from those countries, only then can you relocate to those countries. So you need to find out the status of your country in the immigration service of another country to know if you can move from your country to this country and then to a third country. Okay? This is something that most people never ever think or ponder about before they start to make their travel plans. So I don't want you guys to make the same mistake. And the next one is... Finally, are people from your country regarded as a flight risk? Meaning, are people from your country blacklisted from traveling to another country? I, in the last point, I gave you guys examples of people from Somalia, from Czech Republic, from Israel, and countries that they're not welcome in. Now, you need to find out what is the immigration or international relationship between my country and the country I want to travel to. Do people in my country freely move to that country, or are they under some level of travel ban? Have they been blacklisted from traveling to that country in a way that they are seen as a flight risk? You need to ask yourself this question before you start making plans because guess what? You're going to apply for a visa, they're going to accept your money, but they're going to deny your visa. So you're going to waste all this time, put in so much effort, but you're going to get little to no return by way of outcome. So you guys need to ponder these 12 points deeply and ask yourself which one of these points have I considered seriously while I am preparing to move to a different country and make your plans accordingly. Now guys, don't forget, if I was too fast in this video, feel free to go to the settings tab below, click on the gear icon and slow this video to the level that you feel is best for you. And if you still don't get it, why don't you leave me down your comments in the comment section or slide into any one of our socials and leave your comments there. Our social media handle is the same for all three platforms. It's up there at Fuse Chronicles. And if this video was impactful to you, if it helps you in some way, shape or form, why don't you think about subscribing to our YouTube channel? by going down and smashing the subscribe button, particularly if you're interested in travel, tourism, and lifestyle related content. And if this video somehow was helpful and you wanna catch our subsequent videos when they drop, feel free to click on the bell icon, which is the notification button that keeps you notified when we drop future content and valuable videos such as this one. And if this video was a blessing to you, if by now you know things that you haven't thought about in your preparation to go abroad, why don't you give us a thumbs up? Yes, go ahead and give us a like. It helps us more than you can ever imagine with the YouTube algorithm. It tells Mr. YouTube that you found this video valuable and you're gonna find more people such as yourself 
all around the world to show these videos to. And if you have family members or friends who are thinking about traveling abroad and you've heard about one or two points that you think they haven't considered, why don't you think about sharing this video with them so that they stay guided on the best decision making process to get into going forward as regards to your relocation to a foreign country. And in our next episode, I'm going to be coming out with companies that are currently hiring globally for people interested in getting to New Zealand with a work visa, okay? And like I always say, happiness is a choice. It's your choice. It should be your choice to choose to be happy. Not the place of your family members, your friends, and certainly not me to make you happy. But it should be your place to say, yes, I want to be happy today. And if happiness for you is moving to a different country, moving abroad, use this video as a guide to know things that you should be aware of and make plans accordingly for you and your family's trip going abroad, okay? And if you want to know more, if you want to know more about traveling to the UK on a work visa, Taking into account companies hiring right now that don't require much by way of work experience, a video is going to pop up to my right. Why don't you click on that video and stay guided on the best companies to apply to going forward. And until the next one, I remain your value-based king, Fuse. I'll catch you on the next card. Bye-bye for now.